Summer Reading is here. Visit summerreading.queenslibrary.org for our full summer reading program schedule, book lists for all ages, and other resources to keep your kids engaged and learning all summer long. Queens Public Library, along with the New York City Department of Education, will be providing free lunches for all children under 18 throughout the summertime. Summer meals will be offered Monday to Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. through August 31st. Enrollment is not required and there is no cost. For more information and a list of participating libraries, visit queenslibrary.org. You can take QPL with you wherever you are. Our digital materials, including e-magazines, e-books, and more, are available 24-7 from anywhere with an internet connection. Download the QPL mobile app at connect.queenslibrary.org. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with Nadja Spiegelman, author and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, Astra. The New York Times said about Spiegelman's memoir, I'm supposed to protect you from all this, a richly detailed memoir about the contradictory life narratives that connect and divide four generations of women, a sprawling account that ends with a series of ecstatic family visits. Print Magazine said of Astra, the expansive feel of Astra goes beyond its diverse lineup and dynamic look. The publication provides a thoughtful approach to international literature by honoring the art of translation, engaging directly with global communities, and representing creators on their own terms. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pank, Huffington Post, and I've recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions' Penguin Random House, which will be released this fall. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, the queer reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement, my first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marie Media in 2011. It is streaming on Plex and soon on Tubi. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, will be released in spring 2023 by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its ninth year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Nadja Spiegelman is the author of several books, including I Am Supposed to Protect You from All This, Zig and Wiki and Something Ate My Homework, Zig and Wiki and the Cow Lost in New York City, A Subway Adventure, and Blanca Floor. She has served as the editor-in-chief of the Paris Review and is currently the editor-in-chief of the journal Astra. She regularly writes book reviews for the New York Times. Nadja is the daughter of Arch Spiegelman, the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel, Mouse, and Francois Moulet, the publisher of Raw and Tune Books and the art editor uh, for The New Yorker. Thank you, Nadja, so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me here. It's our pleasure. So let's start with your books. Um, can you tell us a little bit about I'm Supposed to Protect You from All This, your memoir, which is about your mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and you, it also deals with memory. Um, it was published in 2016. And before you comment, I'm, I'm really curious um, as to what it was like writing something so personal and how your mother um, and grandmother reacted to it. Also, I recall in that book, you even doubt your own memories as being possibly imagined. <laughs> so go ahead. The floor is yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so that's a lot. That's a lot of questions. All yes, <laughs> a small thing from earlier, just because. Um, but in my bio, um, I was the online editor of the Paris Review. Well, okay, I'm in chief of Astro Magazine. But um, okay. with my novel, I was. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I was someone who was telling stories from the time I was very, very, very young. And yet growing up in my father's shadow, I think I worried that no matter what I did, it would be compared to his work. Um, and I felt like I could I could write like 
lesbian science fiction and it would still be like Art Spiegelman's daughter writes a novel. <laughs> so like I wanted to figure out how I could do something that um, that would be taken on my own terms. And one way of doing that was to do a sort of something that was very similar to what he had done of like interviewing my mother and my grandmother and doing the matrilineal history in my family and being a narrator in that work who's present in the same way that my father is in Mouse. Um, mm -hmm. And yet doing it in a way that was entirely different. And in some ways it was also the one thing that he wasn't able to do. He wasn't able to get his mother's side of the story. And so that was one genesis for the book. The other was that my mother, um, I mean, she was always referred to as like, especially when I was growing up, I think that's has changed in recent years. But when I was growing up, she was often referred to as Art Spiegelman's wife, an important mm. woman in her own right, even though mm. she was this absolute force of nature. She yeah. was yeah. someone who could make a couch fit into a doorway that was five inches too small by just going, couch, go in, and then like, <laughs> And like, <laughs> revolutionized the world of comics with the underground yeah. comics magazine that she was making had been the New Yorker's art editor for the past 20 years, I think now almost 30 years. Um, wow. She um, she was she was a, an incredibly and is an incredibly intelligent and accomplished professional woman and also as a mother was like a uh I, if I was like if this is what a woman is then I don't know how I will ever be one there was no wow. there was no vulnerability wow. there was nothing she couldn't do um and I I didn't know how to find my path to womanhood by looking at her because I mm. was just I our relationship had been very rocky when I was an adolescent and then um, and then she she had left home at 18 and was very she was a very French mother in the way that mm. like she was like, I'm not your friend. I'm not going to like and, and, and there are certain things you don't need to know about me. I, you don't need to know about my past. And so she would make these illusions like mm. you and your brother are so lucky that I'm raising you an ocean away from your family because you don't know how terrible that could have been or how difficult they were. But she would never say more. She would just say, I'll tell you when you're older. I'll tell you when you're older. And so there was this moment when I was in my 20s when I really wanted to know and I sort of like insisted that I was old enough and really wanted to know and also um, that I wanted to be able to write about it. And she like sure. took it really, really, really seriously. My, my, my desire, my question, she like thought about it for a really long time. Sure. And then she was like, okay, I'll tell you anything you want to know up until the moment when I meet your father and then there are some things you never need to know. And so she told me, she let me ask her anything about her adolescence from like how she had lost her virginity to, mm -hmm. um, to various suicide attempts that she had had mm -hmm. and just an extraordinary amount of vulnerability that I had never imagined possible in my mother who I saw as so ferocious. Um, sure. and, I think through that process, like I, I began to be able to see her as the girl who she had once been, and she was able to see me not as a girl, but as the woman I was becoming. And we wow. sort of met each other on equal footing in a way that was deeply reparative to our relationship. Um, and I, I think I'd begun with the question of like forgiveness, because you know I was like 23 and I was still angry. I think it's impossible to survive adolescence without being angry at your mother. And I was angry at my mother mm -hmm. and I um, and I was thinking about forgiveness. And I remember mentioning that to my mom who was just furious about it. And she was like, I don't need you to forgive me. Um, but um, <laughs> forgive me for what? Yeah. Um, but um, but I, I came to a sense of deep understanding that was actually far more powerful than forgiveness of just sort of like understanding the, the many, many layers of, of intergenerational trauma. Um, yeah and how they kept getting passed down, how the things that we weren't talking about and weren't exploring were still like moving us in, in ways we didn't even realize um, and moving our relationship in ways we didn't even realize. And I also like part of my mother's, sorry, this is a long answer, but it was- No, 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 I'm glad, keep going, please. This is uh, great, yeah. Part of my oh, mother's yeah. power um, it came from like a really rigid, just like sense of reality, like she, if she wanted something to happen, then she would make it happen. The advice that she's always given me and that I've always found useful is like, first you need to know what you want and then you just, then you can make it happen. It's knowing what you want is the hard part. Making it happen is easy. But that ability to sort of like just decide on what the future would be and make it happen extended to the past as well. And so things that didn't fit her narrative of like our family or how we'd gotten here had never happened. They're, just didn't happen at all. And I would keep diaries where I would like write a big circled red R on the top of the page to like be like, this was real, this really happened. <laughs> um, and um, and so part of writing this book was a way of, 
of exploring how there is no objective memory when it comes to, there is no objective truth when it comes to family memory. The third place that it came out of was I had a writing teacher I deeply admired um, and still admire, whose name is Ann Fadiman. She wrote a book called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down about the Hmong community. And mm. she was a very strict proponent of truth. She would say like, if you're writing about a memory that you had and you're not sure, you don't, if you, don't say your mother's dress was blue if you're not sure that your mother's dress was blue. And that really made me spiral because I was like, but if I imagine my mother in a blue dress, then she's wearing one. And then suddenly, like in my memory, she is actually wearing a blue dress. And then that is real to me. And who's to say that it's not real? Because sure. if from a, if, even from a, neuro, from a neuroscience perspective, like the memories that we retell the most often are actually the ones that are the most fabricated because every mm -hmm. time we recall a memory, we bring it back up to the surface and we write over it and re-encode it. So the truest, our true memories, neuroscientists say are like dinosaur bones from which we have to like reconstruct what dinosaurs actually looked like. Um, mm. And the ones that have narrative to them, the ones that are stories are not true at all. They're stories. That's the purpose of memory is to, is to be a narrative meaning making device. And so, um, and so I w wanted to write a book that sort of gave myself a voice as someone who had a reality, but also gave my mother a voice. And then I wanted to get to know her mother who was the villain of her stories. Um, mm. And so I moved to France and I interviewed my grandmother extensively about her adolescence um, and got to know as much as I could about my great grandmother. And all of these stories completely contradicted each other. Like nobody's nobody's version of the past had anything to do with anybody else's. And yet they were all equally true. And that was where I wanted to get to the most with the book. That's fascinating. I mean, it's it's a it's a lot more sort of um, my background is in clinical psychology, so I could really appreciate this sort of uh, this subjective power of memory and and how we tend to unintentionally, unconsciously, like maybe obfuscate or or recolor or reshape or redesign or, or revise, and we don't do it intentionally, consciously, or maliciously. It just sort of happens that there's a filter that <laughs> a neurological filter mm -hmm. that these experiences are passed through. Um, very interesting. And there was also, I remember reading, um, I think it was in, in the, the Guardian as well, where you perhaps gave an interview at one point when the book came out and said that there was a, a you had always felt that there was a dangerous mm -hmm. quality. I think you used the adjective dangerous. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, well, you're going to have to refresh my memory on what I said. Uh, did I say a dangerous quality to memory or a dangerous quality to telling a story? I think specifically a dangerous quality to you, the family, your matril matrilineal family. That oh, yeah. Well, my... You described them or, or didn't describe them or... Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I like, I knew in my bones that my family was dangerous the way that I had been taught that, like, crossing Canal Street was dangerous. <laughs> fast food was dangerous. Like <laughs> my, my, The way that my mother got stiff around her family, the like anxiety that she radiated. Um, we, I saw my French family, we would go, we would go for Christmas. Um, and I sensed that they were dangerous um, in the mm. way that you do as a child. Um, and, um, and, and then I got to know, I mean, my mother's side of the story and her mother was a a really equal, I mean, <laughs> from such a long line of like wildly uh, like powerful women in ways that like can be kind of totalizing. And my grandmother mm -hmm. was that also. She was someone who, uh, I mean, like more than one man has committed suicide over her. She had many lovers. Mm -hmm. Like she did not want to be a mother. She was a beautiful, beautiful woman in France in the 60s. She had come from from nothing married a man who she had pushed into becoming one of France's first plastic surgeons and then lived this wow. like this glamorous socialite lifestyle, then divorced him when she had three young children. And that was not something that was at all done and went to go live on a houseboat that she decorated and designed herself. Um, she was a re she had a like loaded shotgun above her bed and she had eyeliner tattooed on her eyes and she was <laughs> oh, a really interesting person. <laughs> wow, really cool. Um, yeah, that's great. She didn't. Um, she didn't carry a photo of me in her wallet or ask me any mm. questions about myself. I think one of the only questions I remember her asking is, "I um, when I was a teenager, I'd like gone to do one of those trips that privileged teenagers do, where I'd spent some time in Tanzania, and then I'd gone to Paris after to see my my grandmother. And I remember her looking me up and down and saying, "How did you manage to get fat in Africa?" Which was just oh like, the encapsulation of my of everything problematic that always comes out of my grandmother. <laughs> um, but like, um, she yeah, she was difficult. Um, and uh, and also really really 
lovable. And when I moved to Paris, mm -hmm. I got to know her as as the girl who she had been, the girl who'd been born out of wedlock to a mother and almost out of rape to a mother who hid her away and never acknowledged her, um, who, um, who'd grown up in the midst of World War II and like been, and it was interesting, I mean, just, it was interesting being in France, their like lack of, um, especially just considering my father's work and my, my patrilineal, my patrilineal heritage, like, mm -hmm. Everybody my age who I met in France, their grandparents had been had like hidden parachutists during the war. They'd all been part of the resistance. Nobody had been complicit with the Nazis. Nobody had been led. And, and of course, that's not that's not true, and wasn't even true in my matrilineal family. My um, my my grandmother during the height of the war, her mother um, was in love with an Italian who bootlegged alcohol to the to the Nazis and who um, and they ate salmon and wore Burberry and um, and all this while the other part of my family was in concentration camps. Wow. Wow. In wow. terms of not in terms of like being able to hold two truths in mind at once, yeah. like was also one thing that was interesting to think about that like that like there is that nothing is black and white um, no. and, and things come from different places at the same time. Um, but yeah, the my, 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 everybody is complicated. I think what I love the most in terms of reactions to my book is so often um, I get notes from people who have read it who are like, wow, your your mother or your grandmother remind me, so this story reminded me so much of my story. And then they tell me their stories and their stories are fascinating and completely different. They have nothing to do with my mother and grandmother's stories. They lived in entirely different places with different dynamics. And yet like every story has at its root this question of of, of self-mythologizing, myth-making, mm -hmm. and the things that get passed on generation after generation. And and every person, when you look at them carefully and are willing to sort of compare their their powerful adult self to their vulnerable childhood self, contains these inherent contradictions. I, I agree. I mean, I think that's really rich and profound and, and revelatory. Um, the book is uh, I'm supposed to protect you from all this. Let's switch gears for a moment to Zig and Wiki, the Zig and Wiki series. These are essentially children's books. Um, yeah. How many are in the series? That Zig and Wiki series, there are two, I believe, and then there's the Lost in NYC. They're all um, they're all part of my mother's. Um, one of the many things that she has done with her um, career is she makes these learn to read children's books called Toon Books that are all leveled early reader comics. Um, uh, she'd come to, Fran to America from France where there are comics for children everywhere. Um, and, um, and then when she was teaching my brother and I how to read, there were no comics available. And she's always been a really big proponent of comics being a really powerful pathway to literacy because they, sure. you like, can get the clues from the images to understand what the words yeah. say. And children want to read them. And when children want to read something, why would you keep yeah. it from them? <laughs> so, but in America, we have this complicated history with comics, as I'm sure you know, Brian, where like we, there you have the comic book burnings and, and the various codes that like have taught us that comics cause juvenile delinquency. And so we are suspicious of them as, as tools for literacy. And so she created this children's book imprint that, um, that is meant to be used in schools and they're all leveled early readers. And she has, has asked me to write a few of them. Um, and the first one that I wrote for her, I remember her saying to me, like, can you write for me um, a, a children's book about the nitrogen cycle? Um, and I was like, what? <laughs> so I was like, you know, like about the cycle of life. And I was like, okay, cool. So, <laughs> I, kind of, I kind of did that. And then the second one, she was like, great, cool. I want the same characters and I want it to be about recycling. I want it to be like this, al it's two aliens and like she was, and one of them has information they're sort of like nonfiction children's books, in part because like, in part because boys tend to want to read nonfiction. To be very gender essentializing for a second, like boys tend to want to read nonfiction, and as I'm sure people who you know work with at the library, like there sometimes those things are very very divided. And so I wanted to make a story that was like, and boys tend to be slower to literacy than girls. Um, and so I wanted to make a book that was both that was a fictional story about friendship, but also had all these facts about animals and about the world. Um, mm. And um, and so the second one, she was like, can you make one where a character gets thrown into the recycling and then it's about sort of like how we recycle. So I started researching right. what happens when you like put a bottle in the recycling in New York City um, and got so depressed and was like, mom, yeah. this is a horror book. Like this is not, <laughs> this is not a happy children's book. Environmental horror, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
this, this character, like all the recycling that was so carefully separated is going to get compounded together again. And then it's going to be put on a barge and it's going to be sold to China at like a much greater fossil fuel cost than like, I was like, I can't do this one. <laughs> like, but Brown wound up writing about, um, about, uh, about the cows instead about farms um, right. and then there's one that's um the one that uh the one that got the most i think it was chosen as like one of the new york um books in school of the year uh, lost in nyc um that's the one i'm most proud of um and that one was very much based on my experience growing up in new york city and taking the subway very young and the whole story is mapped onto a subway map and the artist who drew it um like took very very careful notes of like every station every stairwell every like wow. detail so it's incredibly mm -hmm. accurate in a way that's really satisfying it's um, lost in new york city a subway adventure right that's yeah. the full title i think it's kind of a love letter to new york city and particularly yeah. the transportation system i guess it's fair to say that yeah. and then there was a uh, blanca floor right which was another graphic novel for for tweens about yeah. latin america and magic yeah, that one just came out. Um, and that one in a way is like, that one in a way is sort of a love letter to my mother again um, as a book. It's it's a it's a classic myth and tale that has been passed through many, many, many different cultures. And so it um, acquired, um, acquired the, acqu whatever, fairy tales, they acquire various pieces and symbols from the various cultures that they pass through. And this is a very ancient one, um, but all the versions of the story that I collated to read to figure out how to tell this, like start with the prince. And I wanted to write a version of the story that starts with the princess um, and with a princess who keeps being told not to show off and not to show off her powers. Um, and then um, I hear you. <laughs> my really freaking out. The door is closed. One moment. I'll be right That's back. Okay. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, and and so, did you did you travel to do research for for that one, or was it just more like a online research? That one, I read a lot of different versions of the fairy tales, um, mm -hmm. and and spoke to some experts in in fairy tales, um, and that that was the main way that I did it. I wrote it. I wrote it through COVID, so traveling wasn't possible. But got it. Got it. Got it. So, Nadja, you were the as we said earlier, the online editor of the Paris Review from 2017 to 2020. Mm -hmm. You're currently the editor of Astra, which just launched this past spring. Yeah. Now, these are both decidedly sophisticated adult publications. How is it different for you to, as we were just talking about, uh, write for children? Do you have a preference or do they, do they both satisfy in different ways, different interests? Mm -hmm. um, well, one very particular, I mean, I, they both, Every all of the things that I've done satisfy the same sort of like creative urge with, with varying levels of like the intensity of um, of existential like, of existential torment that like mm. pure pure writing brings for me. And the reason <laughs> I classify the children's books as slightly separate is because um, is because they're much more collaborative since they're graphic novels that I don't draw myself. Um, mm -hmm. I essentially write like a. a a play a scenario that looks like a movie script um and then go back and forth with the illustrator on that many times um as they start doing sketches and then i like rewrite the dialogue to fit their drawings and so it's much less like there's much less of a of a single authorship to those um and um and my my memoir and and the various articles i've written online um they or for papers um those feel more like they have single authorship. And if, to me, that's a much bigger distinction than whether they're for children or for adults. Mm -hmm. I think that like the the general act of, um, yeah, I, I love writing for children. It's really, really fun. Um, it doesn't feel wildly different for me, for me than it's still the same, like how do I synthesize all of this information into something that feels fun and interesting and has a structure and a shape but yeah. My 13 year old nephew is trying to get me to write a YA horror story. So I may have to, <laughs> I may have to try. I'm curious as to what that would look like. I, I've never, yeah. I've never written for um, children or for uh, teenagers. So I may have to take a crack at it. Maybe it I'll pick your brain before I start. It sounds like you also have worked in so many different, different kinds of medium that that would be an exciting challenge to take on. Yeah, I think so. And I, I can completely um, relate to what you said about the graphic novel process. It almost feels more like making a movie on some mm -hmm. level, you know, yeah. working closely with the artist. We worked with this incredible uh, artist named Igor Karash for the Boys mm -hmm. on Story graphic novel. Yeah. 
Um, it's brilliant. It looks like Edward Hopper. Mm. Um, it, it's, you know, it looks, it looks gorgeous. That oh, you saw Ed oh, showed yeah. you, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in your time at the Paris Review as an, as the online editor, do you feel like you accomplished everything you had set out to accomplish? Or were there a few things yet looking back now, two years later that you feel like you wish you would have had a chance to do that you didn't? And if so, can you share those with us? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I set out, I mean, luckily for my own sake, mm -hmm. I don't think that I set out to accomplish anything. I um, I had published this book and I think you had asked at some point a question that I sort of alighted, which was like, why, why did you, how did it feel to write something so private and mm -hmm. what was the fallout of doing that? Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and I just wasn't thinking about it. I like had to write that book to survive. I like just needed to figure out how I could have my own voice and how it could be my voice and not like the daughter of voice um, mm -hmm. and and also just how my reality fit into my mother's and my grandmother's and um, and so uh, I wasn't thinking about what it would mean to publish it. I was like only writing really late at night um, when everybody else was sleeping. I was living mm -hmm. in Paris. I wasn't I had I I, I I had sold it on proposal and had a contract with a publisher and knew that it was going to be published. But mm -hmm. like for me, I was like, this is a really useful deadline that I have to get to. And I wasn't thinking about the other consequences. And when it came out, it was really hard. It was really hard with my mother and grandmother. They are mm -hmm. both like, part of their power is that they are very much the narrators of their own lives. They are not they are not characters in somebody else's story. And I think that for each of them, the parts of the book where I'm retelling their past as they told it to me, they felt comfortable with. But the parts of the book where I'm present as the narrator and and seeing them and talking about them and, and they exist as characters in my story were really hard for them to contend mm -hmm. with. Um, so many of my, so many, so many people I know, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of writers get this, we're like, am I going to be in your book? Can I be in your book? Like, I want to be in your book. And the thing is, like, no, no, like, you don't want to. <laughs> is to, like, see a video of yourself and you didn't know that you were being recorded, like, appearing yeah. in someone else's books is really uncomfortable. Um, it's like hearing someone say something about you when you they don't think you're in the room. Like, mm -hmm. anything that's not extraordinarily positive is going to sting enormously because you're going to be like, oh, this is what people truly think or say about me when I'm not around. Um sure. My mom, and my mom is also a really private person. Um, mm. So the fact that she had agreed to do this for me and with me was extraordinary. Um, mm. Her reaction was very much like Amber saying to me, I'm not going to let anyone ruin my relationship with my daughter, least of all you. Um, <laughs> least of all my daughter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, um, but, and and now, our, I mean, and be, through the, as I mentioned, like the process of me learning these stories about her really did, like, it, it made our relationship incredibly strong in ways I don't think it would have been otherwise. Um, I became an evangelist at the time where I was like, tell my friends, like, you need to ask your mom when she lost her virginity and when she got her period. And like, you just need to ask your mom these things. And like, sure. my friends would be like, I really don't. Want <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> For me, it really, it really, um, it healed. It was very healing. Um, and, um, and, and, Yet it left me really, really unsure how I could keep writing um, because I didn't want to harm the people who I loved. And I'm more of a of a memoir essay nonfiction writer than I am a fiction writer. And um, and yet, like, I can't I don't exist in a vacuum. And I had and so I wasn't sure what to do next. Um, and one of the things that I was doing to kill time was with my friend. Um, I was emailing back and forth these uh, we would take famous poems like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Are you still there, Brian? You seem to have frozen. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We would take um, there was we would take like famous poems like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, and we would um, translate them into emojis. So I would just send her like tiger emoji, tiger emoji, flame emoji, forest <laughs> emoji, um, and then she would have to guess which poem it was. Oh, that's true. <laughs> It's like so, hieroglyphics are CUNY form or something. Exactly. So we had like we had this going. We had this. This is just what we were doing as part of like killing time and and uh, and then the then editor of the Paris Review, Lauren Stein. Um, I'd written yeah. for him a bit before, and he. I remember him like asking me um, if I had anything to send, and I was like, "Well, I have these silly poems." Um, and so I sent him these emoji poems, thinking like they were so not appropriate for the Paris Review, but was like, you know what, whatever. Um, and the next thing I knew, he was asking me to apply uh, for the job of online editor at the Paris Review. Um, uh, and I 
did. And then I like, he gave it to me and I'd like moved back to New York very quickly. And I had never really worked as an editor before. And I didn't have grand ambitions for like what I was going to accomplish as an editor. Mm -hmm. And yet I arrived at the Paris Review right in the midst of the Me Too movement. And the editor mm -hmm. who had hired me, who continues to be someone I admire, but but also was in the midst of an investigation about his own behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And so he he left the Paris Review a few months after hiring me. And I and there was a, there was a, an interim before there was a new editor. So suddenly I was in charge of this website um, without a lot of oversight. And that was really exciting, especially because there was a lot there was a lot of room for the Paris Review to expand what it had been doing. Um, it, its website had been more like a blog up until that point. Um, so even just like the idea that the website should be, it had been a blog written by a single editor. Um, so even just the idea that the website should publish articles by lots of different writers. Um, but it, beyond that, that like, you know, those writers should maybe be women or maybe not be white or like maybe be talking about queer things or like a lot of things that like just hadn't been happening. Um, sure there was a lot of room to make those things happen. And that was really exciting. Cause like I had this, this platform of the Paris Review and was able to bring in all of these writers who I really, really, really admired and give them space to, to, to publish things. And that was thrilling. Um, so rewarding, right? Yeah. What, what would you say if you could, mm -hmm. was your like toughest experience in those three years? Hmm. Toughest experience. Um, I'm trying to think. My memory is selective for the positive. Um, <laughs> you're, you're constantly it? filling it with new data as an editor now. <laughs> other publication. I mean, there were many times the Paris Review had a huge audience, and it grew really fast. With once we started publishing lots of different articles, like it, it grew really fast. Um, and part of what was hard was the like reductive way in which people approach things online. So, like, I had to learn very quickly that the vast majority of people who encountered the work I was putting out there um, were only going to see the headline and the image and were never going to actually click on it. And so mm -hmm. sometimes they would just like take issue with the headline itself. Um, even, even in cases where it was totally absurd to me, like I published this essay by Jamie Quattro about, um, uh, it was her complaining that when she'd written a novel about infidelity, every time she spoke about it, men would ask her the question, what does your husband think of your novel? And she mm. took issue with that as a question because she felt like it was very gendered. Um, mm. I made the headline of her essay, what, what, does, what does your husband think of your novel? And immediately on Twitter, we were getting all these people being like, Paris Review, how dare you ask that oh question? Goodness. And like, so like, there was a lot of like- it's So frustrating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was that. I made errors, um, like just like actual mistakes. And then like, like the, I'm trying to think if there's anything like really specific that I can remember, but there were times like the the balance between when do you apologize for making an actual mistake, um, a mistake that like has caused offense or caused harm, um, and when do you just sort of like ignore the machine of the internet? Um, those were hard things to juggle, um, and um, yeah. Um, How about what was most surprising to you? Um, it was sort of like the greatest revelation, something maybe you hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Um, I think like w I had so much imposter syndrome when I was starting off. I was mm. like, I'm going to be editing all these incredibly like these writers I admire so much. And like, who am I to tell them what's wrong with their writing um, and not what was wrong, but like what needs to change. Sure. Um, and so a lot of things that I learned a lot of things about being an editor that were really revelatory to me, such as like, that that good writers love to be edited. That like that good writers really appreciate being edited, yeah. Um, yeah. and that it's actually a really really intimate process where like someone is reading your work more carefully than almost anybody else is ever going to, and that that building trust um, that is I mean those those relations the intimacy of those relationships, including with people who I almost never even spoke to on the phone, certainly didn't meet in person, but would work with over and over again. Um, was that was revelatory to me how how intimate and strong those relationships could grow how much trust was necessary in them um the um the feeling that like uh and also the feeling that like because of the way the world works now like i had all this imposter syndrome that had to do in part with being a young woman um mm -hmm. and was like at the time i had just turned 30 and um and I uh, and I realized, and then I realized like people don't even know like I'm just a Paris Review email address. So like learning what it meant to be part of like a uh, editorial board and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and the way that it works now where like you I, I I love talking to writers on the phone when I'm working with them and would like over the as I got to be a better editor learn to pick up the phone more and more often. Um, but um, 
Yeah. <laughs> you really nailed it, though. I think that there is like a real uh, affirming intimacy to be so closely looked at as a mm -hmm. writer by an editor. Mm -hmm. and, and writers certainly feel that when I'm, I've been on both ends as a mm -hmm. writer and an editor. And it's always an extremely affirming um, intimate yeah. process. Yeah. I very rarely had people be like, how dare you try and change this mm -hmm. sentence? And instead, like, could feel, could like you, the, the create the creativity that goes into editing like the moment when you're just like feeling not not that you're creating anything but that you're able to see the best version of the piece yes, like yes. The, what it's trying to be and you sort of are like oh this is where the ending always wanted to be and like this is what it always wanted to be about and if i just clear these things away then it's it's yep. i mean there's stupid things like that many pieces can be made better by being cut down but like <laughs> but then there's also just like listening to like the rhythm of how something is moving and when you can really get inside someone's mind and like you know that what you're seeing is what they were trying to get to all along. Yes. Like that form of intimacy yes. is, is yes. really rewarding. And, and I have several friends who are professional editors and we have this conversation mm -hmm. all the time. And I always say, I feel like the best editors are the ones who amplify the voice yeah. that's already there. Yeah. Know? They don't try to change you so that you're suddenly mm -hmm. adhering to their voice. Yeah. They, they enhance your own. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think you would say you were most proud of um, during your tenure at the Paris Review? Is yes. it? Yeah, we had some pieces that went viral, and I was very proud of each of them. Like, I was proud of an essay I published right as as the editor in chief was was leaving. That was about um, what do we do with the art of monstrous men, and sort of like was examining um, the role of like Woody Allen in the culture. Um, there was a writer and is a writer who I adored named Sabrina Ora Mark, who I reached out to after reading a book of her short stories and encouraged to write essays. And she um, she wrote these really wonderful essays that were centered around fairy tales. And she wrote a whole column of them. And they were, I knew they were so good. They were among the best things they were publishing. And that's the other thing about publishing online is like there's such a difference often between what's really good and what goes viral um and like what gets a lot of traffic so i learned all these silly things like if i published anything about mark twain people wanted to read it um but like but like but i figured out how to get pieces to get traffic which is just a thing that your brain learns how to do if you stare at google analytics and publish the article yeah. every day but like but i also learned that like these really really good things like you just have to keep believing in them for long enough and eventually it will work and so like when one of her pieces went viral which was after like two years of her doing them every single month. Um, uh, and she'd built a really loyal following, but she'd written this essay called um, Fuck the Bread, the Bread is Over that came out like right in the middle of the pandemic. And um, and then she, that, that essay got a lot of attention and now she has a book coming out of, of exactly these essays with Riverhead in the, in the winter. And I feel really proud of that. That's great. I feel I feel proud of my friend CJ, whose essay, The Crane Wife, just came out as a book. Um, I, um, but, um, but more than that, I think in the beginning, I had to find a really clear like vision and editorial statement for what I wanted the Paris Reviews website to be. I wanted it to be a little bit different. I was working with these strange structures where like I couldn't publish fiction or poetry. I couldn't publish straight reviews or criticism. Those were like baked into what the Paris Reviews ethos was. So I was like, okay, well, what do I publish um, that makes sense as a website for the Paris Review, um, which itself is a literary magazine. Um, mm -hmm. And so I came up with this formulation of like, I want to publish first person encounters with arts and culture. I want to publish essays that are like really, really come from a deep place of passion and engagement. Um, and that like take a first person voice to like bring you into this subject that this writer is so is so enthralled in that it's going to become interesting to you. Mm. And it, you didn't even know it was interesting to you to begin with. And like, it'll be carried by the strength of the writer, but also by the strength of their passion. Um, sure. And I think that like, by the end of my time there, um, a lot of people were sending, like agents and editors were sending me essays being like, oh, this is a Paris Review essay, or like this essay was written for the Paris Review, or like this is the kind of essay you're looking for. And I think being able to establish a like tone and a direction enough that like the kinds of things I was looking for in the world were starting to come back to me, that mm. was the most satisfying thing. Wow, that's, that's incredible, that's tremendous. Mm -hmm. And then how did Astra come along? Uh, how, how did you get involved in yeah. Astra? Um, I had always, I had always dreamed of starting a magazine. I mean, like that, all, I, being an editor brings me all of the like deep creative joy with none of the like, I don't deserve to be alive angst that writing does. Um, <laughs> so, like, well, I do always want to have both in my life. I like just find pure joy in being an editor. Um, and, um, and so I'd always wanted to do a magazine, but there's like so few avenues for doing that in the United States that, um, 
I I saw just from what I could see around me that like an editor, uh, someone starting a magazine, their main job would be fundraising and asking for money. And I didn't want to do that. So, um, but um, this publishing house called Astro Publishing House sure. was formed um, in 2019. And then they wanted to have a literary magazine and they posted a job listing and asked me to apply for the job of editor in chief who would create a new yet to exist magazine, um, which seemed like an absolute dream job listing. <laughs> imagine existing anywhere um and um i created like a, a similar a similar as i'd done in the paris review like a vision a vision for like what i wanted this magazine to be that i didn't feel like was being done anywhere else and um and they gave me the space to do it and that Fantastic. was incredible. yeah and so it's 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 referred to as the international magazine of literature mm -hmm. so how up from aside from the obvious how is it different from all of the other journals out there now? Is it that the focus is so intensely on world literature or are there other things as well? I think there are a lot of things that make it very unique. Um, <laughs> Tell I, me all of them. <laughs> um, yes. but here it is. So in terms of what it is, what we wanted most to create was, um, we wanted to create a magazine that was like, that was international, but more than that, that was cosmopolitan. There, the few things that there are that are focused on international literature, even though I, I respect them enormously, but I think a lot of them take this approach of um, a slightly anthropological approach and an approach of like, we're going to put a pin in every country in the map and these each of these writers are going to represent these places and reading this literature from far away is going to be good for you and medicinal and it's and you're going to like learn something about this foreign other and i had lived i had lived in paris and when i lived there i like met all these people who were from beirut or who were from algiers and i felt like people who were from capital cities or chose to live in capital cities had so much more in common with each other than they often had with their fellow countrymen like i identify mm -hmm. very strongly as a new yorker um and and felt like there was a closeness about, about people who chose to be in cities. Um, and part of what defines a city is its multiculturalism and its proximity to many, many different cultures. And so I wanted to create an international magazine that didn't try and put a pin in every country in the map, that didn't say this writer represents France, but left a lot of room for writers to maybe live in Paris, but have been born somewhere else and have parents who are from yet a third place and be writing through many different cultures at once. Um, or, and. So, so that was the desire to make something that was genuinely cosmopolitan and where the writing um, speaks to you really viscerally and directly and feels transgressive and subversive and feels less like you're learning about the foreign other and less and more like we are all outsiders looking in and like okay. and that and that feeling is what I love most in most writers. So like just being able to unite that feeling in a global way was really exciting to me. I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I was going to say that's I you know I've been thumbing through your your journal for yeah. course all week and that is something that jumped out at me immediately is that sort of visceral quality mm -hmm. to the writing yeah. very dynamic and exciting and I I love that idea of like a world of outsiders you know whether yeah. it's New York or Madrid or yeah. Mumbai we're all mm -hmm. similar to that we're cosmopolitan we're in cities mm -hmm. and we're, yeah. we're outside looking in together. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think that like there's just a some of it has to do with like the way the Internet has broken down space and time. And some of it just has to do with the like the it's it, in its own way. I, there's nothing inherently political about this magazine. I think it's really exciting to make a literary magazine that doesn't have that as its as its first layer. But in some ways, like the only response to the rising nationalism and fascism in the world is an answering multiculturalism and is to like affirm that as strongly as possible and to be like, actually, like, we are not that different from one another <laughs> all around the world. Like we, we all like procrastinate on our phones. We all eavesdrop on conversations. We all like have things that we're ashamed of. We all have secrets and like, and so sort of going into those places was what was really exciting. So every issue has a theme. The first one's theme is ecstasy. The second one's theme will be filth. The next one will be lust. And after that will be broke. Um, but very much with the idea that like, it's not boring. None of this is boring. I love that idea too. I was going to say that each uh, issue is thematic. <clears throat> so this issue was just released in the spring. Is that yeah. correct? When will issue number two be released? Issue number two is coming out in October, um, but we work on very, we're, it's distributed like a book. So it's distributed into bookstores, which means that we work on very long, but one can also subscribe online and we would be so grateful if people subscribed online, but um, uh, 
<laughs> it's distributed also into bookstores. So one can go into an independent bookstore and ask them to order it in or find it there, hopefully. Um, and um, uh, it comes out twice a year. I, another thing that I think does make it different from the other magazines that exist right now is simply its production values. Like it's it has gorgeous. Full yeah. maps and it's printed in four color. And it and also art, there's art as well. Yeah. It's filled with art and with comics. And I think it's very rare to have a literary magazine that also has such a strong visual element to it. Um, it's beautiful. So yeah. that, that I hope sets it apart. And that's our second issue is going, even though it doesn't come out till October, it's going to the printer um, on Tuesday, as I was just saying. Uh, okay. <laughs> Crunch time. <laughs> Crunch time weekend. <laughs> I'm gonna flash a sneak preview. I actually haven't shown this to anyone. This yet. is exciting. This yeah. is a this is a culture connection exclusive. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. A preview of what the cover is going to look like. Um, Ooh, but this will be our self yeah. issue, and then the French flaps will like open up like this. Oh, that's um, and beautiful. There, and then in the back, um, we have this. I and love it. It opens like that, and then like that's, that. That's um, stunning. But yeah, I mean, this, it'll be on nicer paper than this, but like it, that's just a printout that I, I think. Love it. You know, Thank you for sharing that with us. That was exciting. That was pretty cool. Um, so the obvious question now becomes, you know, are the challenges different running an established publication like the Paris mm -hmm. Review, which has been around since mm -hmm. 1953, it's 70 years old, yeah. versus your own brand new journal that you just birthed a couple of months ago? Yeah. <laughs> What's What feels different? <laughs> I mean, like I'm learning so many things I didn't know already, but there's there's a lot of things that are different. Um, the challenges are different. I mean, including like figuring out like how how do we distribute this in a way that makes sense? How do we get more readers? How do we? Um, uh, but but the more exciting parts are that like there, we're not a, a legacy publication. There's no there's no like heavy history to it. And so every question can be like, well, how do we handle this? How do we handle these questions? And we can reinvent it every time. And so from questions to that are like how, if we're running book reviews, like are we running book reviews of books when they come out in the UK or when they come out in the US? Like we get to make everything up. And that part is really exciting. I'm trying to think of like, a particularly exciting one that we had recently, but every single week with my staff, there's something that comes up that instead of being, instead of the question being like, what do we do in this situation? It's always what should we do in this situation? And we get to like make that decision for the first time. Um, and that that I find thrilling. I mean, we, we go really far. We try really hard to like to be creating as the magazine that we want to see in the world. Like we have we have a fair number of very well known writers in our first and second issue. Yeah. Which really yeah. excited about but we also really want to our goal and dream is to serve as a launching pad for writers who don't yet have a presence in english and there are a fair number of writers in these issues also who've never published in english before and so we go very far out of our way to make sure that those writers are paid the exact same way that well-known writers are paid that the translators are paid um very well for our magazine which just aren't things that are done everywhere um and um and yeah that i mean that kind of thing like trying to credit all the illustrators, all the translators, all the contributors on like completely equal footing and acknowledging that like when one of these pieces goes into our magazine, um, you have, oh, I'm trying to find one that's in translation, but you have, because um, about a third of the magazine is in translation, a third is in global English, and then a third is um, is written in, in originally in English um, by American writers. Um, but, um, but every piece, um, and I can't find the right, Oh, here at the end. Um, every piece like has a credit for um, for the illustrator, for the translator, for the um, for the original, for the writer, and like and all of those things go into the experience of what you're reading. And so we want like each of these people to be to be clearly credited in the magazine. I think just getting to think through things like that that are sort of like ethical and important to us and then thinking through mm -hmm. how to enact them through like design and practice, those things are really fun. It's really satisfying to be able to sort of do something yeah. at that level and have that much power. Mm -hmm. and yeah. How do you decide on the themes? Um, we have a really long running Google doc of like potential <laughs> themes. So like the, the most constant joke we make is like, that would be a good theme. <laughs> like, um, but what we want, well, I mean, so like half the themes in our Google doc are just like emojis or nonsense words we've said to each other. Um, <laughs> what we want most of the theme are themes that are really, really universal. I think like we want to be making this international magazine that is not about the foreign other. And as I said about the idea that like we are all outsiders who share this common experience. And so 
So themes like ecstasy or lust, um, they're things that we all feel. And so we're interested in that. We're also just really interested in publishing the very best writing we can find. So we want sure. the an expansiveness to them and where like we can fit something in, even if it's not perfectly on theme, but yeah. I, I want to switch gears yet again and talk about your dad for a second, if we can, because sure. we're coming to the end of the hour. I read in The Guardian, I think it was the same article. When you were five years old, you were with your dad in a restaurant. He had just won the Pulitzer from Mao's, and you told the waiter who he was, but then your dad scolded you because he thought that you were bragging. Mm -hmm. I that was beautiful. Like, what, you know, Would you talk a little bit about that and that sense of humility that your dad um, imparted? Sure. I mean, that was like, I, I felt that was my earliest experience of deep shame. I felt really, really mm. embarrassed for having done that. Um, and then like, I've come to wonder if like, everybody's earliest memories of shame, like if somehow shame is this memory that like sears itself in this, if it's... most of that sears itself into you in a particular way. Um, but yeah, I mean, my dad, my dad, I think I felt he felt we all felt like there was him as our as our father and as a person in the family. And then there was like his name, like there was like sort of like the, the Spiegel monster is what my dad called it. Like the famous this other thing. And so like, and, he, and it's sort of like this like pixie fairy dust that gets sprinkled mm -hmm. on you and like, and and erases any sense of actually being yourself. And so I think it, it's, it's, you feel very split. You feel like there's like this person who's my father and then there's this person who is the, my dad often draws himself as like a man wearing a mouse mask that's like tied around in the back and tied. And like mm -hmm. that, that I think does, it feels accurate. <laughs> um, yeah. That's great. Um, I just want to let everybody know we're going to be taking questions from Nadja shortly. So if you have any, please start sending them in. And while we wait, I still have a few more questions of my own. Surprise, surprise. Um, so <laughs> on, the, on the subject of your dad, of course, Mao's has been in the news a lot lately um, because the McKinn County Schools in East Tennessee voted to ban it for profanity, violence, and nudity, which of course is inherently absurd. Mm -hmm. But as an author and editor, what do you, you know, what do such actions signify to you? What do you think this portends? You know, it's... Um, uh... And also, what were conversations like at home as this was happening? <laughs> well, as it was happening, <laughs> my mom, so my dad, like, was asked to go on CNN to talk about this, and um, and everything's happening over Zoom or over the internet now. So this like this interview on CNN happened like at our kitchen table, on his laptop, and I remember my mom like sending me this like video that she was taking on her iPhone from the side, where she was like, "Oh my God, your dad has like yogurt on his beard, and he's in." <laughs> so embarrassing oh, and, then, and then the video aired and it's like you know it's these cnn newscasters who are in their suits with their like gelled back hair and then it's my yeah. dad who does in fact have yogurt <laughs> on his beard and his face <laughs> um and like and it, and yet he comes across as so cool because he like yeah. he doesn't care um and um and i think and also the fact that he's vaping um i think <laughs> it was a, I think was, it was a week and it wasn't it was like 10 a.m and it was a it was a nicotine vape but like um, <laughs> But uh, but he like got dubbed the coolest man in America for doing that. <laughs> That's cool. That is cool. We were pretty, I was proud of him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a moment. Of, it's a great opportunity to find levity in an otherwise like really insane situation. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it was a really it was a really insane situation. I mean, I think that like there's so many there's it, it's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of like the the portentous horrible things that might be happening. The idea that like te that the idea that parents should have a say on what their kids get taught in schools is deeply upsetting. The idea that schools are going to be following these like really strict morality censors of like, we can't have curse words, we can't have nudity. I mean, I think that within my family, part of what was just obscene and painful is like, I mean, any, if you're familiar with Mouse, the majority mm -hmm. of the book is anthropomorphized. So it's mm -hmm. cats and mice, and there's only one part of the book where there's human figures, and it's this strip that my father drew when he was much younger than he was even writing mouse he just couldn't bring himself to redraw it and it's about mm -hmm. his mother's suicide and the the nudity in question is my grandmother's na naked body in the bathtub after she slit her wrists and the mm -hmm. idea that like that could be seen as a sexualized image um yeah. that was so upsetting <laughs> to all of us i mean i think that that, that like the violence of just like of, of just saying like oh this is a naked body and that's a problem um and not understanding the context in which it right. appears um yeah. that was really upsetting um it's especially frightening that these are people who are working for a school 
system. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, these are people who are supposed to be educated who care about yeah. edu education and literacy um, and sensitivity, yeah. you would imagine. Yeah. So it's really, it's really tragic, I think. It's, it's too bad. Um, I have a few more questions. Tell us about the online edition. There's also an online edition as yeah. well as the print edition. Is it different at all with regard to content? So everything that's in the print magazine is available online, but then we also are publishing um, five or six original pieces online per week. Um, and those pieces, we're publishing book reviews just because I don't think there's enough space for criticism in the world right now, especially criticism of um, work that originally wasn't work in translation. So we're publishing reviews of books in translation every week. And we're also publishing the same kinds of things I was publishing at the Paris Review. So first person encounters with arts and culture essays that are driven from a deeply passionate place um and i'm really excited about those it's been really exciting to build a team of people who i trust so much our online editor spencer has just been doing a really wonderful job curating the content online um and sam the deputy editor of the magazine is in charge of the book reviews and it's been really just thrilling watching like that feeling of just like each person brings such so many beautiful different things to a project and then it all falls under this umbrella is really exciting that is that is pretty cool. And if we could just get the cover of Ashtra, the first issue of Ashtra yeah. up again. Actually, we have, um, there we go. We have it on the screen. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the artist or the, the design? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so this this artist, um, let me just make sure I don't say her name incorrectly, but Isabel Wenzel, um, mm -hmm. she, uh, she is a young person living in Germany, um, and she is an acrobat. Um, she's trained as an acrobat, so she uh, holds all of these poses herself, all of these wow. portraits, and she then takes the photo on a self on a self timer. Um, and I just thought these were really these were just like ecstatic, fun, exuberant yeah. images that like brought me so much joy to look at. Um, and then, and also like, I think, I mean, just from an art director's point of view, we did want to have like, while it's a human figure, it's a figure who's like, whose gender is slightly indeterminate, whose race is slightly indeterminate, whose face is not clear. And yet, even though it's a photograph and so it's, a, it's an image on which like anybody can, not anybody, but like, it's not a specific person. It's a person, um, it's a person doing a very specific thing. And it's the action of the body more than the body itself. That's what's important. Um, and so that, that was part of what we wanted as a feeling for the cover too. That's fantastic. That's great. Um, I guess you, we. I guess you and I did such a thorough job, Naja, that no that people have no questions for us. So uh, we've exhausted all topics. Actually, I have one more still. What was it like growing up in such an intellectually stimulating and creatively abundant um, household? I mean, it's, it's um, it was. <laughs> Uh, it was it was wonderful. I mean, this thing that I wanted to be able to recreate, it was hard too. I mean, like mm -hmm. we had dinner together every night and you had to be able to hold your own at the dinner table. Sure. Like, if you want to tell a story, it better be a good story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, uh, th that was your audience. Like your yeah. mom and dad, just, they're not typical moms and dads. It's like, yeah. yeah. I and mean, one thing I loved about growing up with my dad is like, he, I once called him an idiot savant for words, I think I angrily after like, he'd like trounced me at Scrabble once again, but like mm -hmm. he just, he had like an almost like, like uh, he had an incredible ability with words, has an incredible mm -hmm. ability with words and um, and a real generosity about the things that he knows. And so growing up, I, one of my, I would just constantly be like, dad, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? Like, what is, who is that person? What is this? Um, and I like every child does that, but I had the privilege of having a parent who could answer in like such mm. concise and interesting and profound ways. Once on the subway, I asked him, I can't even remember which politician it was. It was someone who was running for mayor at the time. And I was like seven years old and I don't know who it was, but I asked him, I asked my dad, there was like a campaign ad on the subway. And I asked my dad who that person was. And he gave me like this real rundown of like New York mayoral politics and like who this politician was like, but fit for a seven year old, one I could actually understand. Um, and when he finished talking, the entire subway car applauded. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, he just was, he's a really, really part of, some people think sometimes that, and I, and I, I think as an editor, I feel very attuned to this, that like, if you can use more words and words that no one knows and make a, a sentence as complex as possible and make the reader feel like they can't fully understand it, that there's like a density of thought that is itself a proof of intelligence. Um, and I think my dad, because he comes at things from comics, which are themselves this sort of like humble and popular medium, um, 
he he applies all of his intelligence to making things as simple and clear as possible. Um, and I was always so grateful for that as a child because it meant that like he was so in intellectually engaged with the like, how do I explain the Holocaust to my seven year old? How do I explain like mayoral politics to my seven year old? Sure. <laughs> and, and was willing to like really just do that for me with anything I wanted to know about. And it, it that felt like a real gift. But oh, that's great and. The journal is Astra, and the website is Astra. Yeah, it has a sort of sneaky hyphen in it, but if you Google Astra Magazine, it'll come up too. It'll pop up, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Astra-Mag.com. It's fantastic, and issue one has been released a couple of months ago. Issue two will be out in October. You could also find the um, tangible copies <laughs> in your bookstore. Uh, available now and also this fall. Nadja, thank you so much for this. It's been um, incredibly insightful and fulfilling. Thank you so much for doing it with me. It really was a pleasure. And thank you all for tuning in. Have a good evening. Have a safe weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.